1817, David Ricardo's landmark book was published. In this book, David Ricardo uh, responded to Adam Smith and his theory of absolute advantage with his own theory of uh, comparative advantage. And his argumentation was this. He said that Adam Smith is right to say that uh, uh, trade opportunities, mutually beneficial trade opportunities, exist between two countries that are naturally different from one another. But I expand this argument by saying that trade, mutually beneficial trade uh, arrangements or opportunities exist between any two country, regardless of their natural endowments. This was his argumentation. Uh, he explained it by saying that um, even if uh, of the two countries, let's say uh, US and Mexico, uh, um, one of these two countries can manufacture uh, both of the two products that we're considering in our simplified model, more efficiently, more cheaply than the other, which would be Mexico in our case, then uh, there's still trade opportunities between the two countries. In other words, Mexico would still not want to uh, produce both products and sell both of them to the US and instead only produce one of them and buy the other one from the US. And the reason is that, uh, David Ricardo said, uh, the uh, uh, two products are not equally profitable for the country, for Mexico. Uh, one of them is more profitable than the other, so therefore it makes sense for Mexico to uh, use all of its scarce resources for the production of, the, of that product that is more profitable to Mexico and buy the other product from the United States. So uh, that's why his theory is called comparative advantage. So it's a matter of the profitability of the two products, not just uh, the natural endowments and uh, whether or not there is an absolute advantage uh, in the manufacturing of one product over the other uh, in two countries. So uh, given going by the Mexico and U.S. example, let's imagine uh, that those in our simplified model, uh, Mexico and U.S. are the two economies and the products we're dis uh, discussing are avocados and laptops. Uh, when you consider uh, their production in Mexico, both of these products would be manufactured or produced more cheaply, uh, simply because the all of the production factors would be more uh, lower priced in Mexico. But uh, what we see in real life is that Mexican producers or companies would go on to manufacture avocados instead of laptops simply because avocados are more profitable for them. And they would want to use their limited resources to the manufacturing of that product, avocado, that brings more profits to Mexican companies. And as a result, there becomes a, uh, an unsatisfied demand in the Mexican consumption market for laptops, and the U.S. companies would uh, step in and fill the gap and set by selling their U.S.-made laptops in Mexico. So there you have it. Uh, just like David Ricardo said, trade op mutually beneficial trade opportunities would exist between any given two countries, not only between two countries that are naturally endowed differently from one another. Uh, another example, a uh, commonly given example in the literature and as well as your textbook, I believe, is that the, the difference between Sweden and France. Again, two countries in Europe with distinctly different climates. Uh, Sweden is a much colder climate in North uh, Eastern Europe. France is a uh, warmer Mediterranean cl climate, at least the southern parts of it, uh, in Western Europe. So. Um, if we are considering furniture manufacturing and wine producing, uh, we would have a picture like the one that shows in this table. 
So for a company in Sweden to manufacture one unit of furniture, whatever that unit may be, so don't co confuse yourself with those details, uh, then Swedish company would have to spend 100 units of production. Again, whatever those units may be. Uh, whereas the company in France would spend maybe 90 units to manufacture the same uh, unit of furniture. On the other side, for wine production, a Swedish company might be spending, might have to spend on average 120 units to manufacture a bottle of wine or a case of wine or whatever, the, again, the unit may be. But a French company could probably do it for 80 units because of their uh, 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 differences. So as a result, when we look at this picture, we see that both products uh, uh, manufacturing is can be done more cheaply in France. But what we see in real life and what David Ricardo reminds us with his theory of absolute, I'm sorry, theory of uh, comparative advantage is that it makes sense for French companies to manufacture wine and uh, uh, buy furniture from Sweden. And they trade these two goods with one another simply because France uh, manufacturers spend 80 units of inputs to manufacture one unit of wine, whereas they have to spend 90 units of inputs to manufacture one unit of furniture. In other words, it is more expensive for an average French company to manufacture one unit of furniture than one unit of wine. That is, wine is simply more profitable for the French company. As a result, companies in France would go on to use their scarce, their limited resources to, uh, to, to manufacture wine only and don't touch the furniture sector. And, and they sell wine to Sweden and they buy furniture from Sweden. That is the core of uh, David Ricardo's uh, theory of comparative advantage, which is the underlying theory that explains our international trade today. Uh, because these two concepts can be a little uh, confusing at times and it requires a very clear understanding of it, I'm here I'm uh, including a video for you guys to explore on your own time. I'll, uh, below you will find a link to this video. Please make sure to check it out uh, to uh, further expand your understanding of these two concepts. So one question to discuss and think about this further, what is the economic concept that underlies the theory of comparative advantage? Answer is the opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is the, simply the idea that value of a foregone opportunity must be considered as one of the costs of another company that's, I'm sorry, another opportunity that is taken. So let's say uh, you could uh, read a book now or you could listen to this uh, lecture. You have two options, uh, two opportunities. And so you chose to listen to this lecture, which provides you certain advantages, uh, but uh, the reading a book would also give you some certain benefits, provide you certain utility, economically speaking. Uh, the joy of uh, reading and learning new things and perhaps quiet time, etc. I suppose it'll be more enjoyable than listening to my voice. Uh, so imagine that you somehow quantify all those benefits of reading. And by choosing to listen to this video, this lecture, you are given up on the opportunity to read your book. So therefore, you're given up on the opportunity to take on all those uh, benefits or utilities uh, from reading. So therefore, all those utilities of reading must be considered as a part of the cost of you taking this lecture. So it's not just the time you spend, it's not just the money you're spending for your education um, and what uh, whatever other costs you have, perhaps time away from family, you know, by doing this you can't you can't be with your children, perhaps, or with your families, what have you. So that those are all costs of listening to this uh, lecture for you. And the value of your best foregone opportunity, which is reading a book in my example here, would be one of those. 
costs should be considered as a cost. This notion is called opportunity cost, and it's a purely economic term. Business people and accounting and finance people do not have this concept. They don't think this way, only economists do. Uh, and this concept is the, the underlying uh, approach or concept that, that uh, uh, explains the theory of, of comparative advantage. Uh, from these two uh, theories of two classical economists, Adam Smith and uh, David Ricardo, two more contemporary or uh, current time uh, uh, economists created a theorem. Uh, two Swedish economists by name uh, Heckscher and Olin, so we today call this heckscher olin theorem, and they said that uh, because of the insights provided by Ricardo and Adam Smith, uh, uh, a capital-intensive economy should produce and export capital-intensive goods, and a labor-intensive economy should produce and export labor-intensive goods. So, for example, Colombia would be a labor-abundant economy, and Germany would be a capital-abundant economy. The money, technology, know-how, te uh, and machinery, etc., would be more abundant in Germany since it's a more industrialized economy. So, therefore, according to heckscher olin theorem, Germany or German companies should produce more of capital-abundant goods like cars, and Colombian companies should produce more labor-abundant, meaning uh, those products that require more labor than capital for production, those type of goods such as coffee. And predictably, that's precisely what we're seeing today.